Hello everyone, Vivar from PTC, or Port Terra Conglomerate here. We're an Australian industrial conglomerate specialising in everything from mining through to salvaging and all of your repair, rearm and refueling needs. We're here with our latest video to give you an overview of one of the most well-known and well-loved ships in the game, the Drake yeah. Interplanetary Cutlass Black. Over the course of this video, we will cover the ship's lore, her overall features, specifications, and how PTC likes to use the ship. As a bonus, we'll also try and draw some links to real-world vehicles that fulfill a similar role to how PTC likes to use the affectionately nicknamed Cutty. The story of the Cutlass Black, at least initially, is the story of Drake Interplanetary itself. With this in mind, we will first go over the early history of Drake Interplanetary and its home system Magnus, before carrying on to the ship itself. The history of Drake is intertwined with the history of the Magnus system, first discovered in 2499. This was a relatively ordinary system with a K-type star and three planets. Magnus 1, is thought to have been a gas giant that has had its atmosphere ripped away by the star. Magnus II, a desert world, but a good candidate for terraforming, and Magnus III being a super gas giant that has managed to escape the star's clutches. Its distance from the major space lanes and abundance of heavy minerals made it a perfect site for a large naval base come shipyard kicking off in 2533. This sadly only lasted for about 50 years, until thanks to the bean counters back on Earth's budget cuts, and strategic shifts towards systems such as Killian, which led to the large-scale Kalimaring, or abandonment and subsequent depopulation of the system, with its population dropping to sub-30,000. Kind of hard to sustain an economy when only military-related businesses are allowed to set up shop. For some time, due to the incomplete terraforming, Magnus was a barren desert planet with a decade-long period of solar flares slowing its continued shift to a more temperate world. Thankfully, the original military classification of the system expired in 2751, meaning that other sorts of colonists, a non-military affiliated, were now allowed to move in and set up a more diverse economy and society. Due to the haphazard nature of the recolonization of the system, the next lot of people were a little bit more of a ragtag bunch of all sorts, such as claim jumpers, frontier types, and the less than savoury. This demographic shift led to a anything-goes sort of a culture for the system, which over time transformed into a frontier code of honour sort of a setup. More recently, with the success of Drake and the system government getting back onto its feet and running promotional campaigns and tourism campaigns, they managed to create a place where anyone can start a new life, believing that someone's past doesn't necessarily define their future, thereby echoing Drake's own rise to prominence, so long as they don't mind living in one of the more rough-and-tumble systems of the UE. Now on to the Cutlass Black and Drake Interplanetary. The Cutlass Black, aka the AS-1 or Assault Ship 1, was initially created as an entry for the 2845 Volks Fighter competition. This contest was seeking a economical, yet flexible and capable space fighter that could be built rapidly and in large numbers to outfit the frontier militias as a multi-role craft who lack the funding and the infrastructure for more advanced or maintenance intensive craft. The Cutlass sadly lost out in this competition to the now-forgotten Wildcat, which is somewhat ironic considering the ongoing Cutlass's popularity with both the legitimate and less-than-legal citizens of the verse. 
Not taking no for an answer, the development team, led by Jan Dredge, decided to pivot target markets over to the civilian side of things and become a dedicated full-blown ship manufacturer. It was felt that by targeting non-UE-affiliated militias, they might stand a chance in this market as well as in areas where insurers decided to jack up the premiums due to the risk profiles of the systems. As for the name, it wasn't really a sentimental choice at all, but more merely made due to marketing and because it sounded smooth. Once the decision had been made, they had to decide where, just where the hell they were going to base themselves. And, well, Magnus, with its shipyards and cheap real estate, naturally sprang to mind. To say the Cutlass Black was a hit is to put it mildly like saying the A2 is only a minor concern at Jumptown. In less than a year, they had so much demand they had to open six off-world factories with dealerships in nine systems. Within the next year after that, the company had quadrupled in size. Within five years after initially selling the Cutlass, they had rocketed up the space cast manufacturer charts to become the fifth largest manufacturing concern and could barely source parts quickly enough to build the craft. The good times, however, were about to take a turn, to quote the Terror Gazette. The Travel Safety Advisory System estimates that 15,000 people die annually in outlaw raids, and the Cutlass Black accounts for two-thirds of all ships in use by known piracy groups. Due to Drake's less than stellar background checks when selling such a phenomenally versatile and decently armed spacecraft, Outlaw organizations had been buying thousands and upon thousands of the proxy things. This had been happening at such a scale that cutlasses had effectively become the du jour ship for pirates, miscreants, and really anyone, the more upstanding members of the UE would rather be kept the hell away from their cargo haulers, due to how cheap she was to purchase and how easy she was to maintain and repair. Largely before this MVP of piracy had come about, they were mostly using old, if not obsolete, military discards and surplus ships. Investigations by the authorities found that cutties were handling a wide variety of less than legal tasks, such as drug running, non-consensually borrowing cargo on a permanent basis, and even duking it out in smaller systems with authorities in small-scale skirmishes. It only got worse from there, though, when the uh, CEO of the company, Jan Dredge, was caught stating that Drake knew who it was selling to, i.e. known pirates and pirate groups, but didn't care. Naturally, the families of dead piracy victims were less than pleased with this, and they even went so far as to the point of requesting the cessation of the Cutlass Black's manufacturing. Drake, naturally, deciding they liked making money more than they liked their CEO, turfed her out on the 6th of April 2947. Her son, John Dredge, was basically shoved in place until a suitable replacement could be found to help carry on a bit of legitimacy. Thankfully, he only was in place for about a year. As in 2948, Drake called a press conference on Odyssey to announce Anden Arden as the new CEO, which probably rustled the jimmies of the Dredge family, as they then mandated uh, training for all sales personnel regarding UEE and local laws, likely pertaining to armed ship sales and background checks, as well as condemning piracy as a whole. They didn't stop there, as it was under their purview that ships like the Kraken, the Mule, and the Vulture were created, all trying to shift the perception of Drake away from its piratical past and towards a more industrial, utilitarian future. As for the Cutlass's features and specifications, 
She needs a crew of about one to three, has 46 SEO cargo, and can be yours for a steal at 1,385,300 AUC, and is also rentable if you're in a pinch at most refineries and cargo decks. She's 37.5 metres long, 26.5 metres wide, and 11.5 metres tall. In terms of components, she's got one size 2 radar, one size 2 or medium computer setup, a single size 2 power plant, two size 2 coolers, a single size 2 shield generator in a front back setup, a single size 2 jump drive, meaning you can mount my favourite jump drives, being the XL1 or the Crossfield. She also has a single utility beam mount of size 1 at the rear, and I'm pretty sure I remember seeing something somewhere about those arms at the front also doubling as a part of that tractor beam setup, but I've been unable to substantiate that, so if you've seen it somewhere, please point it out and I'll edit the video. In terms of weapons, this is where she really shines in addition to her cargo bay and that utility mount. She can carry quad size 3 fixed gun mounts for the pilot, or quad size 2 if you like your guns gimbaled. Dual size 3 for the turret with pretty dang generous capacitor amounts, and in terms of missiles, she can mount anything from 48 size 1 missiles, which is my personal favourite loadout, through to 6 size 4s, for when you really need to tell someone, I don't like you. When it comes to the Cutlass Black's turrets, they've got a surprisingly decent amount of elevation at about 80 degrees. They, of course, have full 360 degree coverage, with it not really being able to shoot below the horizon. The only notable issues with the turret coverage are two sort of risers that you have to deal with over the two primary engines. When it comes to her flight performance and profile, she has an SEM speed of about 165, a afterburner speed, or non-SEM, of 1115, pitch maximum of about 85 degrees a second, yaw of about 90 degrees a second, and a roll of about 110. Her quantum tank is about 2500 litres, and her hydrogen is pretty decent so long as you're not constantly in the red and abusing the thing. As far as her profile's concerned, to put it mildly, she fights like an 800 pound wild boar whose Wheaties the other pilot has just relieved themselves into if you catch my drift. Whilst not a dogfighter per se, the Cutty does have a few tricks up its sleeve in terms of how she likes to fight in addition to being a good missile slash support fighter. Now, she may not be as agile as light fighters, but the Cutty does have a very good top speed and good acceleration. Think boom and zoom fighting style, or to use the boar analogy, charging in to gore the enemy before sprinting away for another run. To be specific, in terms of her handling, whilst not traditionally agile, her VTOL thrusters are very fast to swing into position, and can be used to rapidly alter the direction of flight when combined with boost, as all of a sudden your main thrusters are pointing roughly 90 degrees from where they were but a moment ago. Now, when on approach or chasing a target, she has ample missile stores to keep up a withering stream of personally addressed packages of screw you in particular, and when things get up close and personal, like her turrets and pilot guns gore the ever-living daylights out of whoever has decided to take a swing at you. When it comes to claim times and costs, the Cutty comes in at 648 without being expedited, and when you decide to rush things, she comes in at about 2 minutes and 15 seconds for less than a 3000 UEC expediting cost. Now unsurprisingly, PTC likes to pretty much use the Cutty for everything under the sun. But what may be interesting is our real-world equivalent to her, the MH60 DAP, or DAP, the Direct Action Penetrator. 
This variant of the Venerable Blackhawk is geared towards special operations and configured as a gunship with limited troop carrying capacity of about 6 to 8. The DAP has a variety of additions to the base Blackhawk, such as stub wings for carrying a combination of munitions, such as M230 chain guns of 30mm calibre, 19 shot Hydra 70 rocket pods, Hellfire missiles, Stinger air to airs, and GAU 19 pods, as well as M134 gun pods. The M134s or GAU 19s can also be used as the door guns. And from memory, there is an Israeli DAP that has a chin turret mounted. To tie things off when looking at the capabilities of the Cutty, we can see she's a bit more heavily armed than, say, the base Black Hawk would be, leaning, to, leaning her towards the sort of roles DAP is used in a very less combat capable helicopter such as the standard. Cutties like the Black Hawk DAP get in get the job done, and then get the hell out of there before anyone else realises what's happened. By way of closing remarks, the Cutlass Black or Cutty isn't a ship I like. It isn't a ship I love. Nor is it really a ship I hate, all her issues being known. It is honestly and sincerely a ship as that has earned for my respect. This thing has gotten me into, and subsequently out of, more fights than I care to admit, has copped more abuse than it has any right to be able to withstand, or deserve to take at times, and has also been able to limp home in a state that could be charitably described as beyond death more than once. She may not be the fastest ship, or have the biggest cargo bay, or even be the hardest hitting for her size, but she will have you and the other pilot puckering your o-rings every second of that fight whilst still carrying troops or small vehicles and enough missiles to make anyone blush, or for a price that'll catch anyone's eye. If there was only one ship I could ever choose to be my faithful companion against the verse, out of all the ones I've had the pleasure of interacting with to date, it'd be the Cutty. She may occasionally be beaten and bloodied, and occasionally be down in a fight, but she didn't hear no bell, at least while the other pilot still breathes. Remember, it's not the size of the ship in the fight, it's the size of the fight in the ship. Thank you all for watching this video. If you've got any comments or queries or questions, feel free to put them down below, and all the needfuls in terms of like, subscribe, etc, etc. Ta-ta!